I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy! We're not worthy! You got space, man, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. At home, my name is Jonathan. You're watching the Wrestle Rock Podcast Season 5. I'm hosting this episode with my partner, Benoit. How's you going today, my friend? I'm very good. Yes. We have something to announce. Yes, of course. We're going forward with... Um, last weekend, uh, we received Mr. Uh, Lou Ferrigno and... Um, we will uh, receive a uh, Q&A exclusive with, with him, so stay tuned, uh, everyone. It Lord, was at the Montreal Wrestling Con yes, 2024. Ex exactly, Lord Ferrigno is coming to the Wrestle Rock podcast. And also, we have a good uh, partnership with LWA Live Wrestling Auction, a good friends of us, uh, GF Firestorm. If you search uh, something about uh, professional wrestling so just go to the LWA on Facebook and also Mr. Uh, Jeff Leduc um, organized a very big uh, virtual signing with Paul Leduc the uh, brother of uh, the father the, the, fa the, 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 the brother of Joe Leduc oh yeah the brother of Joe and yes the, the, father the, of the, the, the yes the legendary wrestler the defined Joel Duke, and also he will be with his son Carl Duke. So stay tuned. The event will be Sunday, August 4th. But today we have a special guest, my friend. So a former NWA talent. Yes, I'm talking about Mr. Nikol Nikita Kolov. As you going today, my friend? Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, I like this shirt. The Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Yes. I like that. Yes. I like that. That's the Heart Foundation. Great. Yes. We oh, uh, that that's uh, and Heart yeah. Foundation. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. Come on. That, I love it. That, that's very funny because uh five minutes before the interview, uh someone knocking in the door and I receive my shirt. So that's awesome. That's a brand new uh unboxing shirts and that's good timing. Awesome. Oh, good yes. time. Well, uh, great to be on Wrestle Rock Podcast. I appreciate yeah. you, Jonathan, and thank you, Benoit, for having me with having me on with you. That's no awesome. Problem. And finally, we got the man. We're talking about the USSR guide, and we're going forward with the first question. So oh. go ahead, my friend, with the first oh, question. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Okay, Mr. Koloff, uh, before your uh, career in the professional wrestling. You played football, but you were injured twice, which put an end to your career. What were your two injuries uh, exactly? It's a great question. Uh, and, and, you know, when it comes to whether it's football, wrestling, uh, professional wrestling, or, or any other sport, injuries are a part of the game. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I know a lot of people, you know, have their their ideas of what professional wrestling is like, but I can, I can tell you, I have my share of injuries in wrestling as well. Prior to that, in my college days, I, I had a fracture, my freshman year of college, a fracture of my, my lower leg, my tibia and fibula, so both the weight-bearing and, and the non-weight-bearing bone. And, and that was four months in a cast and a probably about a year-plus recovery on that one. Fast forward to my senior year in college, and, and I duplicated, you might say, of the exact same thing, only my other leg. So it was my left leg that I fractured, both tibia, fibula. That one was technically what they call a compound fracture because the bone actually came through the skin. So that was a little more a recovery. And, and that was the 
end of my college career, but it didn't discourage me from continuing to possibly uh, pursue a professional career. And by the way, since we're talking about football, uh, for the record, always been a fan of the CFL. In fact, here's a little known fact for you. Dave Scrine, who <laughs> was head coach the 1963 Grey Cup winner, Okay. was one of my coaches in college. And that's where I became okay. a fan of, of Canadian football. In fact, he wrote a book called Countdown to the Grey Cup. And so just a little side note that some people would not know, uh, being you guys are uh, up, in, uh, up in Canada. And uh, we, of course, uh, had a very intense and uh, – wrestling uh career so but we need to uh, rewind all of this and uh your first time when you step it into the ring uh how many months of training did it takes you to be able to wrestle in front of a wrestling crown so for me for those who are not familiar with that story it's, it was trial by fire is the way i i describe it and okay. what i mean by that is i graduate college so just to fill your viewers in on a little more backstory i graduate college i spent a year and a half rehabilitating the fractured leg and and mm -hmm. training for a pro football tryout and i get a phone call from someone known as road warrior animal lod wow. legion of doom okay I, I had recruited Animal out of high school to play college football with me. He dropped out of college, gets into professional wrestling, and then you might say he recruits me in, in, into wrestling. Mm -hmm. And so the day I showed up at Jim Crockett's office in Charlotte, North Carolina, guys, I had never been in a, in a professional wrestling ring, and I had no amateur wrestling background. Okay. I had no professional training, okay. and we we – we were introduced, I was introduced that day on interviews and then told to be in Raleigh, North Carolina the next night for my debut in the ring on television in front of a sold out crowd, wow. having never been in a ring. That's the trial by fire. That's a very big challenge, if you know oh, yeah. what I mean, because uh, that was a fantastic good old days because today it's very different, you know, and yes. Uh, in the past, he, he, he push a guy uh, directly on a ring and let's go, go uh, you, do your best, my friend. And that's that's funny because we interviewed a lot of people and sometimes, like you, of course, we discovered that that's the same situation, you know, and. That's a big challenge, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Let, uh, yeah, it really was. Let me just interject to say, yeah. I mean, it, it was a make or break situation, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that you know, I was either gonna, you know, I was either gonna succeed or fail, and if I failed, my career was over before it started. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they kept the match very short, uh, and, and and since he's got the Heart Foundation on, my very first match was a guy named. At, in those days, as Bret Hart, but not the Hitman, oh. he went on to WWF as Barry Horowitz, and oh, okay. uh, that was my very first opponent. And, okay. and fortunately, I didn't fall on my face. And over the next couple three months, Ivan Koloff, another great Canadian, uh, Don Kernodal, would take me to the towns two three hours early, and we would train in the ring. And then I'd have a match that night. They were the world tag champions. They'd have a match. Uh, and, and then every night on the drive home, we would talk about the psychology of wrestling. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned, guys. That's how I learned. Wow. Okay. Uh, you uh, began your wrestling career as a man from uh, USSR uh, during the Cold War between USA and Soviet Union. Who was uh, behind the, the gimmick of uh, a Russian guy? So, so the whole idea, you know, the whole idea behind the character was was Don Cronodal and Sergeant Slaughter oh, okay. technically came up with the idea of a ne a nephew, a nephew, if you will, for the Russian bear Ivan Koloff. Yeah. Ivan's getting later in his career. 
And they thought if we can find a young guy, big guy, make him his, you know, mold him into his nephew, and and that would extend Ivan's career, and then of course give me a career. And and so Don Cronola actually approached Road Warrior Animal and asked him this: Do you know any big guys who who wouldn't mind shaving their head and becoming a Russian? And Animal goes. I know the guy right now, and he made the phone call, and the rest is history. Uh, we are from Quebec City, and at three hours uh, of Montreal. our city, uh, there is Montreal. So you met a Montreal native named O'Reil Donald Paris, better known as Ivan Koloff, and soon after, the transformation occurred leading to your uh, collaboration as the Russians, of course. Yep. Could you tell us more about the transition from uh, Don Cardono to Ivan Koloff, Give, given that uh, Kernodal was your first partner in the team uh, at the time? Yeah, so, so they're the World Tag Team. So the whole idea, when Don Cardono and Sergeant Slaughter Mm -hmm. put together or, or came up with the concept or the idea of a nephew for Ivan yeah. and, and approached Jim Crockett. The, the goal was to, because at the time, Kernoda was looked at as a, what they call a turncoat, uh, a, a Russian, sip, an American, but a Russian sympathizer, right? Because mm -hmm. he's partnering with, with Ivan Koloff. So, you know, what a traitor, right? What a traitor yeah. Don <laughs> Kernoda is. And so the whole idea was I come in, eventually turn on Don Cronodal, which we did that part eventually, but then Sergeant Slaughter would come back in and team up with, with, uh, with Don, and then we'd have tons of matches of, mm -hmm. for the World Tag Team belts, flag versus flag, the American flag versus the Russian flag. Little lace. All, most of that unfolded. The only hiccup, the only glitch – was Sergeant Slaughter decided to stay in New York with WWF at the time and not come back to the NWA. Mm -hmm. uh, but the rest of it, we still did. Uh, and, and it was quite a, quite a transition to uh, for, even for me mentally to project myself into the role of being a Russian teaming with Ivan and, and then being, being hated by the fans. Right. Nice. Okay, uh, Mr. Koloff, uh, we'd like uh, you to tell us about your experience at Starcade 86 when you faced the Nature Boy Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight title. <clears throat> yeah, so I, here's what I love about wrestling fans. And uh, they, these guys, you guys, they research everything, man. They come up with all these statistics and all these numbers. And, and recently I saw where apparently Flair... Uh, it was uh, the number one opponent who, who, in other words, who I had the most matches against was <laughs> Ric Flair. And it was a hundred and something matches. And apparently wow. I won like 64% of them or something. And, and so starting with that very first ever Great American Bash in 1985, that was the first time I stepped in the ring against Rick. Okay. And then from there, fast forward to Starcade of 86 mm -hmm. uh it no was a, a pivotal time for me because as some know I, I had went to the other side i went from bad guy most hated to <laughs> good guy teaming up with the american dream doth the road the tower of power <laughs> too sweet to be power if you will right <laughs> and we became the superpowers and And, and so that was a memorable night in the Omni in Atlanta in that Starcade match uh, because there was a lot that transpired after the match as well. But uh, it was interesting to now wrestle him as a babyface as opposed to prior as a heel. So mm -hmm. totally different role and a totally different response from the fans. About Memorial Moment, uh, you participate in a piece of history. I'm talking about the WCW War Game in 1992 with uh, the greatest, 
Sting, oh, sorry, Sting, <laughs> Flair, Arn Anderson, Beautiful Bobby, Larry Zabisco, Steve Austin, Ricky Steamboat, and Dusty Road. We would like to hear you from from you about this experience because you wrestle against the greatest of all time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's really uh, quite a, a, a who's who of wrestling, right? That are that we're a part of. Really, both. Let me just back up for a minute for your viewers. The very first okay. ever, uh, the match beyond War Games, right? The Superpowers, the Road Warriors, Precious Paul Ellering against the Four Horsemen with J.J. Dillon. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, in the Omni in Atlanta. A lot of big shows back, back in those days in the Omni in Atlanta and in Charlotte, North Carolina. And, and so that match that night kind of set the tone or set the stage, if you will, for what was going to happen in the future. So fast forward to 1992, yeah. Sting's Squadron. Uh, against uh, Paul E. Dangerously Dangerous Alliance, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and when you look at all the guys that participated that night in that match, once again, from a fan perspective, uh, I think it's got to be remarkable, right? You mentioned, you know, cool. Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, yeah. you, just, you go down the list, the, the Stinger, uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, right? Yeah. You go right down the list. And I'll say about the war games that, you know, some of the fans may or may not know, you know, the strategy behind that, the concept of the whole war games, uh, I give credit anyway to, to Dusty, to Dusty Rose, the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, a, I feel, a creative genius when it wow. came to, to, to putting concepts together like the war games, two rings, two cages, a mm -hmm. cage on top, nobody yeah. in, nobody out. And then to bounce back and forth, you know, the bell rings. and So, so it's always a two-on-one advantage, right, until all ten are in the ring. The yeah. fans, by my understanding and having conversations with them, uh, the, re the War Games was one of the most memorable, certainly for me. Mm -hmm but also for many of the fans as well. One of the most often things I hear about are the war games. I mean, here you guys are, Jonathan, asking about it. Um, the, the My matches against Ric Flair and then the best of seven against Magnum TA. Those are the, 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 the matches I, I get questioned on the most. That's funny because uh, this, the the next question, it's all about Magnum TA, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, every wrestling fans know that uh, Magnum TA was uh, of your uh, greatest uh, opponents during your wrestling career, uh, particularly in the context of feuds, and you engaged in multiple Texas then matches with him. Could you provide details on the total number of matches you had against uh, Magnum TA? Yeah, so so here again, really a concept of a credit, credit Dusty Rhodes, who came up with the idea uh, I, from from what I believe, and I've never researched this. Maybe one of the fans out there will, but from what I believe, never before had there been a best of seven for for any title. I don't I don't think. Uh, don't quote me on that. But the idea uh, that that a Russian. Mm -hmm. Nikita Koloff was going to attempt to gain the U.S. the United States Heavyweight Championship uh, by Magnum's interviews and all accounts was a slap in the face to the Americans. Right? No, there's no way we're going to let that dirty Russian, you know, put the U.S. belt around his waist. And so the setup for that, going back to the signing, for those who have never seen the clip with his mom there at the signing and Uncle Ivan at the signing, and, and he comes over the table, and we get into the skirmish. Here's something some of your viewers may not know. Terry, at the time, Magnum, never smartened his mom up to the fact that pro wrestling wasn't real. So in her mind, it was real. So when he came over that table to attack me, and we, in turn, Ivan and I attack him, if you go, your viewers go pull that clip up and watch her reaction, her response. 
That was like real. Like she thought <laughs> you were really like gonna, you know, injure her son. That that was real. Oh. Like, for real. That was real. So that just set the tone for the whole idea or or him being stripped of the belt and creating the best of seven. And, and then the strategy for me to go up one to nothing, two to nothing, three to nothing, making it look like I am, in fact, that superior Russian athlete. And then for him to come back three to one, three to two, three to three, leading into the seventh and final match, in many people's accounts, was epic. Was epic. Wow. Okay, uh, Mr. Awesome. Mr. Koloff, in 1997, you were involved in Pro Wrestling Illustrated, Feud of the Year. I mean, the Four Horsemen versus Superpowers and the Road Warriors. Can you share us uh, an interesting story about that feud? Yeah, probably one of the most memorable that immediately comes to mind was Landover, Maryland. Okay. Landover, Maryland. It was right around, in fact, we just celebrated here in America the, the, the Day of Independence, July 4th, right? Day of Independence. We just recently celebrated that. Yeah. Well, we were we were granted an opportunity to get the uh, CAP Center in Landover, Maryland. Back in those days, Vince McMahon had a real lock on a lot of those buildings up north. And, and so it was really, really hard to get in those. Like like uh, Philadelphia, for example, he had a lock on the Spectrum building, so we had to go to the Philadelphia Civic Center. And then a lot of times we'd have we'd be in the same town, same night, ten thousand people over there, ten thousand people, you know, at the Civic Center going head to head. Um, and so for us to get the land over, he had to actually give permission for that to happen, and he didn't think it would draw. He didn't think we would draw. Well, the main event was an eight-man tag match between the Legion of Doom Road Warriors and the Superpowers against the Four Horsemen. Well, guess what? Not only did we draw, we drew over 23,000 people that night Ooh. in Landover. We were the main event match. And I want to tell you, to the best of my knowledge, guys, those fans – Never sat down. That match lasted about, I want to say, probably a good half hour, 30 plus minutes. I don't know that they ever sat down the entire night uh, or the entire match. It, it was pretty incredible. And, and we made a statement that night showing the WWF at the time that we can indeed go up north and we can draw. Wow, it's totally awesome. <laughs> And about your accomplishment, how did you feel when you found out uh, when you were uh, you were inducted into the NWA class of 2008 Hall of Fame? Uh, quite an honor, uh, you know. And, and you know, I although I you know worked some for for Vern Gagne with the AWA, but that was mm -hmm. kind of in conjunction with the NWA. We were running uh, shows together mm -hmm. um, back in those days in the Meadowlands in New Jersey and other places. Um, and, and so kind of in between stints with the NWA, I would do shows, TV shows, wrestle Larry Zabisco, the le you know, the, the, the legend in his own mind. I, 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 mean, <laughs> I mean, the legend of time. Um, uh, but, um, and, and so to be inducted in the NWA Hall of Fame for me, and again, that, that actually happened in the Omni in Atlanta at, at a show down there. And so that was quite an honor. And, and actually, uh, I'll be heading to Waterloo, Iowa. Dan Gable, one of the most prestigious amateur wrestling coaches, as well as an Olympic gold medalist okay. from 1972, has a Hall of Fame in, in a museum in Waterloo, Iowa. I want to encourage the fans, if you've never been to Waterloo, Iowa, to Dan Gable's museum, you you got to put it on your bucket in your bucket list because – uh, they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and they've asked me to come in and be a part of the 25th anniversary. I was inducted into, into Dan's Hall of Fame, uh, the Professional Hall of Fame in 2006, right before the NWA. And those two Hall of Fames, to me, are just so prestigious to be a part of. Oh, 
cool, cool, cool. And for our uh, pre-closing segment, uh, I'll give you a name and a few words. Tell me something about them, all right? So the first one, the late Rick Rude. Ravishing. Yeah. Hit the music. Here's the word, ravishing. Ravishing. Uh, Rick, Rick and I go back. Rick and I go back to high school. You know, we played high school football Ooh. together. Oh wow! I can't. Oh, you were born in Minnesota. Oh, yeah, Robinsdale, Robinsdale, yeah. Minnesota. Played high school okay. football together, and so to step in the ring against the Ravishing One was quite an honor as well. Uh, and uh, but yeah, he was he was something. He was a great athlete in high school, and obviously, as people saw from his wrestling career, he was a great athlete in general. The second one, the Magnum TA, Magnum, the one and only, the boss. Those are the words for Magnum. The boss, um, probably uh, the chemistry that he and I had because of our styles really complement. I felt I feel like they really complemented one another. And I'll say this: if I've heard this from one fan, I've heard it from a thousand fans. Back in those days, of course, we projected wrestling to be real, right? Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you how many fans said. They walked out of the building after watching our match. I don't know about any of those other matches, but that match against Nikita Koloff and Magnum TA was real. What, what, and that was our yeah. goal. Our goal was the believability of our matches, and it was incredible to have the opportunity to work with Terry. Uh, the third one, uh, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Enning. Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning. So do you guys know he and I went to high school together as well? Yeah. So he and Rick Rude graduated one year ahead of me. Kurt okay. and I also played high school football together and actually played a year of college football against each other before mm -hmm. he got into wrestling. And again, him and Rick and, and the Road Warriors, Barry Darso, Crusher Khrushchev, mm -hmm. yeah. Demolition, another high school friend, all got into wrestling prior to me. And what's amazing is seven of us came out of Robbinsdale High School and all had pretty decent wrestling careers. Wow. And the last one, Nikita Koloff, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, guys, I'm doing things in my life. I've done things and I'm doing things. That, that never really never in a million years did I ever think. I mean, I didn't dream of being a pro wrestler. Mm -hmm. I mean, football was my passion. Yeah. Weightlifting, bodybuilding was, was my passion. Mm -hmm. and, and fast forward all these years later, and, and just an honor to be on Wrestle Rock Podcast with you, Thank Jonathan, you. with you, Thanks. Benoit. Uh, you know, to be able to just share a little bit of my story and, and the things I'm doing now. I mean... You know, I, I have a podcast as well called the Mana Podcast, right? And yeah. it goes to 93 countries around the world. And so I've got a podcast, a radio show. Uh, did I know I, I, I'd be uh, – I had one of these sitting next to me here. Here's yeah. the old world TV title belt, right? Nice belt. So, lot, lots of titles I won over the years. Want to get a closer to that one? Yeah. There's All right. Thank you so much. You're very and anyway, you know, little did I know I – look – here, here's my story, right? Nikita, A Tale of the Ring of Redemption. Yeah. Did I know I'd be writing a book? Did I know I'd be making an available hard copy audio book? No. Uh, how about this one? Wrestling with Success. Wow. You know, this one I tell people is motivational. This one is inspirational. Ring of Redemption. Did I know I'd be doing all these things, guys? No, never in a million years. Lex Luger and I team up together and we do this thing that you see the t-shirt here, Man Camp. Yeah. Every spring and every fall, Lex Luger and I do these camps for men down in Georgia. So I, I'm just thrilled to have had the career I had in wrestling and then how that parlayed me into traveling all over the world. I was in your beautiful country in 2017 okay. for a promoter named Danny Dugan, Canadian Wrestling Elite. Okay. okay. Oh, okay, okay. On a on a twenty one day tour, twenty one cities in twenty one days, wow. four pro, four provinces, and I got to see parts of your country I'd never been to before. Nineteen out of the twenty one cities 
I had never been to before. Wow. And it was one of the best tours. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, <laughs> Canadian. Say hi, to Danny. Say hi to Danny. It was incredible. And, and again, it's just an honor to be here with you guys. And let me just say real quick, too, Jonathan, Go that if, if people want to find out more how to connect to the podcast or follow me on social media or <laughs> – Get an autographed copy of one of the books or, or both or whatever, just go to koloff.net. That's that's the easiest okay. way to connect with me. Koloff.net. That's the perfect. easiest way to find me. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for this 30 minutes generous time. And for ending, as usual, my partner, uh, Nostradamus Ben, it's all about the French prophet. Ooh. And he tried to predict the future of our guests. Go ahead, my friend. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much, Mr. Koloff, uh, for the for your presence uh, on our podcast. It was huge, amazing. <laughs> okay, my prediction is uh, eventually we, we're gonna meet you uh, probably in uh, an indie show, uh, indie wrestling show in US or maybe in a wrestling con, and you're gonna make us a Russian bear rug. <laughs> how about how about a, a russian sickle maybe what do you think ben? Well, maybe a russian sickle why not why not <laughs> uh oh. hey you won't even feel a thing right because wrestling's not real you won't even feel it benoit I hit you with the russian sickle right talk, um, talk with mr uh, magnum t if the wrestling uh, w was fake if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah just talk to magnum he'll tell you real quick <laughs> Nikita was as stiff as they came, you know, so yes. believability. Well, I appreciate you guys. Hey, I do look forward. I look forward to meeting you guys face to face, not just on camera, of but meeting you guys in person, having some pictures together yes. and meeting yes. you face to face. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.